to one You open the eyes of the blind There's no one like you None like you Into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you None like you Cause our God is greater Our God is stronger God you are higher than any other Our God is healer Awesome and power Into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you None like you Cause our God is greater Our God is stronger God you are higher than any other Our God is healer Awesome and power our God Our God is greater, our God is stronger God, you are higher than any other Our God is healer, awesome and power Our God, our God And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against us? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? Our God is greater, our God is strong. Awesome and power, our God, our God. Yes, our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome and power, our God, our God. Yes, our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. The sun it's a new day dawning It's time to sing your song again Whatever may pass And whatever comes before me Let me be singing when the evening comes Bless the Lord, oh my soul Oh my soul Worship His holy name Sing like never before Oh my soul I worship 
worship your holy name. You're rich in love and you're slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul. I worship Your holy. When my strength is failing, the end draws near, and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forevermore. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship Your holy name. Bless the Lord, oh, my soul, oh, my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Soul, I worship your holy name. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name. We'll be in Joshua chapter 5 today. By golly, we got a lot of stuff, a lot of moving parts today, but I think we'll get her all in. So in Joshua chapter 5, uh, in this chapter, we, as you read it, we, and I'm going to start going quicker and quicker in summary now as we go forward, because we've got all the really, really foundational, important stuff in, in us in the Pentateuch, but when you start to read Joshua chapter 5, you learn that the uh, people who were living in the, in the promised land or the land of Canaan, these kings, various, each city back then had a king, that when they heard, they'd already known that Israel, this nation of, of, of God, this nation of over 2 million people had moved and they were just located across the Jordan River. And when they heard that, that the God of these Israelites had dried up the Jordan River for them, and they've crossed over. Uh, it, it, Bible, my Bible says their hearts melted. Uh, I, I have to believe that, that they were concerned when they were across the river. But I think when they heard that their God had supernaturally done something to the river so they could walk across in dry land, and now all two million people were in the land, that, that was... I think they knew anxiety in that moment. I think they felt that not in their gut. They had great concern. A great concern that two million people had just walked into our land, but even greater concern is their God is powerful. Their God is powerful. But as you read on, as soon as Israel had crossed into the land... Uh, God instructed Joshua to circumcise all the males who were 40 years old and under. Well, why 40 years old and under? They wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. They'd been a people of circumcision, people who were following the law until they started wandering in the wilderness. So, so for 40 years in the wilderness, they had neglected the right of circumcision. So God says, okay, 
Now it's time to circumcise them all. Every male under 40 years old. That's, that maybe seems odd to you. That they had been living, these Israelites had been living in the wilderness for 40 years with God's direct presence in the camp day and night. And they were neglecting something that God had said to do. They were neglecting something that was pleasing to God. And they had God's direct presence. And I look at my own life. I think maybe I'm, maybe I'm an Israelite. Because I'm born again. I have the direct presence of God's Holy Spirit in my life day and night. And sometimes I neglect to do the things that I know are pleasing to him. In fact, sometimes I elect to do things that I know are displeasing to him. So I don't look at these people, and you shouldn't either, that they had some great failure. They were just like me. They were probably just like you. Joshua 5.3 says, And Joshua made him sharp knives and circumcised the children of Israel at the hill of foreskins. And you could read that and say, well, he did this on some hill. But I also suspect that when this was done, that there was a hill, a hill of foreskins, that there was a great pile of foreskins. Think about this scene if you want to. Maybe you don't want to. Over two million people means over a million males. The first generation was all gone. Over a million circumcisions being performed. That's, that's quite an undertaking. So as these, all the men were circumcised, uh, Israel camped there while the men healed. And in this, we, we see Joshua. We, we already know Joshua is serving as a foreshadowing or a type of Christ, a representation of what Christ would be. And, and we see Joshua circumcising the flesh. And, and it's a foreshadowing of how Jesus will come and he will circumcise our hearts. This is why you are who you are, because Jesus has circumcised your heart. You take Jesus Christ and his Holy Spirit out of the equation, this would not exist this morning. Every one of you would be like I used to be, and you would say, who cares? Who cares about children in Africa or Asia or anywhere? I'm living my life. But God comes in and he changes things, doesn't he? He circumcises your heart. He takes a heart of stone away from you and gives you a heart of flesh. You're no longer so hard-hearted. You have compassion. You have a desire to share the gospel. And this happens. And Matt, can, can you get this in the camera so that Pastor Alex and others can see these shoe boxes that are about to go out? the same kind of shoebox that has created this relationship we have with them. And, and the, this, uh, you know, that relationship, the, the amount of value we put on the relationship with Pastor Alex and, and others also propels these people, this small <coughs> church, to be so giving. At, at Joshua 5.10 it says, And the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at even in the plains of Jericho. Again, so you know what time of year it was when they crossed the Jordan River. Passover is in the spring, we know that, so springtime. It says they did eat of the old corn of the land on the morrow after the Passover, unleavened cakes and parched corn in the self same day. Now, as you look at verse 11, do you see, do you detect anything that's significant there? I think there's something significant there. This day, this day of Passover and this year of the crossing of the Jordan River was significant. Do you see it? Let me help you. The people who had been living, the, the pagan people who had been living in the land at Gilgal, as the two million people of Israel came across the dried up Jordan River, they fled. They hear Passover, we see Israel eating the old corn. They, they left their storehouses of corn and fled. So so here Israel's is having Passover, they're, they're eating of the corn that was left behind by, by the pagan people. And what's significant is these Israelites are eating something besides manna for the first time in 40 years. This is a significant turn of events. It's a significant day. 
This was the day that not only did God stop giving them manna from heaven, but it's the day they start living in a totally different way. They start living as a people who have a land. Joshua 5.13 says, And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with a sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or our adversaries? And, and he said, No. But as captain of the host of the Lord, I am come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said to him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said to Joshua, Loose thy shoe from thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. So what we have here is, is what's called a Christophany. A Christophany. It's an instance of the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ showing himself in the form of a human to an individual, a face-to-face -face appearance. So here we have Joshua meeting Jesus Christ face-to-face. -face. Jesus presented as the captain of the Lord's host. And we know it's Jesus. We can know it's Jesus because of some detail. You, you go all the way to Revelation and you read about John, the Apostle John, meeting some angels face to face. And then he, his inclination was always to bow down before the angel. But, and the angel always said, don't do that because I am basically created just as you were. So, so we know if this was an angel, the angel would have would not have accepted worship. This can only be Jesus Christ. The, the angel that spoke to John, as John in Revelation tries to worship, says, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only. Don't worship me. So we can see, we can see clearly that the captain of the Lord's host who is presented here is none other than Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ standing before Joshua, ready to lead Joshua and all of Israel into, further into the land of promise. And Joshua falls to his knees, he falls on his face, and he says, what do you want me to do? Now, here in Joshua, you see a true picture of leadership. What do you want me to do? The best rulers are men and women who submit to leadership, who submit to being ruled themselves. And this is why God chose Joshua because he was willing to be ruled by the Lord. He wasn't willing to let this position go to his head and become a tyrant. No man is fit to rule who is not ruled himself. No man is fit to rule who has no parameters himself. If, if he knows no parameters, he becomes a dictator or a tyrant. And history has revealed what men like that are capable of, and it's horrible. So as, as, we, as we continue, it's interesting how many similarities we see between Moses and Joshua, that we know that both of them uh, were likely trained by the Egyptians for 40 years. Both of them spent the next 40 years in the wilderness, and then at age of 80, both of them were picked or chosen by the Lord to lead Israel. And you look here, and, and we see that even their very first encounters, their face-to-face -face encounters were very similar. If you remember when Moses encountered God face to face at the burning bush back in Exodus 3 5. God told Moses, Take off your shoes to ground your standing on his holy. And, and here we see the same thing, the same God. He tells Joshua the same thing Take off your shoes to ground your standing on his holy. So again, this is Jesus Christ in person, who is the good, known, revealed in the New Testament as the Good Shepherd. And I've pointed out to you before that Jesus carries that title, the Good Shepherd, because it was Jesus who shepherded the pure bloodline that was in Israel all the way from Eden to Calvary, that he indeed is and has been the Good Shepherd. And we see a piece of that journey that he was shepherding here in, in Joshua. As you get into chapter 6, uh, the, the inhabitants of Jericho knew full well power of this God that these Israelites had. They, they understood, they'd heard of it, and maybe they'd witnessed it at the Jordan River as you know, something like this is happening. If you have two million people on the threshold of your land, uh, you've probably got some eyes on them. You know, in our day, we, we hear of, of people coming up from South America. They're not two million people. They're maybe 5,000, and, and we see it in the news every day, every day. Are we there? Are we witnessing it? No, we're not, but we're hearing it. We 
there are people there witnessing. Same, same would be true in, in this day that, that the people of Jericho would have, have heard and probably had some people witnessing the crossing of the Jordan River. And they knew things. They knew things. They knew that these were the same people who once upon a time, not that long ago, some 40 years ago, were enslaved by Egypt. And God had freed them through a series of plagues. And he opened up not only the Jordan River, but before that, he opened up the Red Sea so these people could walk across. And they knew that the God of Israel was a powerful God. They worshipped many gods, but they knew this God that Israel had was powerful. He was maybe different than these gods. They may have contributed rain to their gods or this or that in their minds, but this God performed things that was, were tangible. They could see, and it was known throughout the, throughout the land. So it says that they ran into their, their walled cities and they shut the gates, and it's no surprise that this was the reaction of these people. They're hoping, we'll just go inside where they can't get to us, and maybe they'll pass through. Maybe they'll go on by, and once they're gone, we'll come back out. But God gave Joshua specific instruction on how to take the city. This city was on the land that God had promised to Abraham. These folks of Israel, they weren't just going to pass by and go somewhere else. This was their land. God had promised it to them. So God gave Joshua instruction on how to, to take the city. He, he told Joshua that the warriors of Israel were to march around Jericho once a day for for six days in complete silence. Just once a day, these folks are walled up. They've got the gate shut. They're watching over the top. Once a day, go out and march around. Don't make a noise. On the seventh day, God said, I want you to, I want you to march around seven times. And on the seventh, uh, seventh time around the city, the priests were to make a long blast on the trumpets, and at the blast of the trumpets, all the people of Israel were to shout, and that the walls of the city would fall down. We all know this story. It's a pretty common story that we know. So this, this is different, though. It's different in that in that day, to take a walled city typically took several months. Uh, it said that the walls of Jericho were at least 45 feet tall. If you were going to take a, a city like that if, by human might, uh, you would either have to have a lot of manpower and start building earthen ramps up the side wall. You'd have to bring in what they called siege works, which were battering rams and ladders and such, so, so you could break in. Or, or a popular method in the day was to lay siege upon the city, which was to surround it and not let anyone out. Let nothing in, let nothing out, and just do that month after month, and eventually the folks inside are going to starve to death. So typically, that was the way. Typically, it took months to take, a, take a, a city like this. But God says, we're not doing it that way. We're doing it my way. You're going to march around, around the city, and that's all you're going to have to do. Just march. So as, as you continue in the, in the uh, chapter, you remember we looked at Rahab last week who had saved the spies by lowering them out of Jericho, out of, off the city wall on a red cord. Uh, on the seventh day, Joshua tells the Israelites that they can't harm Rahab or her family because the spies have made a covenant with them uh, to look for the red cord, but to s destroy everything else. Destroy everything and everyone else. Keep nothing. Keep nothing. And at at the trumpet blow at, at the command of Joshua on the seven, after the seventh trip around the city, I want you all to shout. And when you shout, you're going to see God do something. You're going to see something amazing. So you look at this, you say, this is, this is one of maybe, maybe the strangest battle plan in history by man's measure. I think that's exactly what God had in mind. That this, this would be such a, an impossible achievement that no one else is going to get the credit. That mankind would have to give Jehovah God of Israel the credit for the tumbling of Israel. How else could it be explained that the walls of the city would fall flat? Well, people try to explain it. 
you read your commentaries and they'll tell you, oh, it must have been a great earthquake. Commentaries. Christian writers. You read, you read commentaries about the crossing of the Red Sea, they, someone will tell you, well, I, I think it was really the Reed Sea, which was north of, of the Red Sea, and it was a shallow, and a certain time of the year it would go dry. And, what, what, what are they doing? They're trying, trying to des describe miraculous events of God with natural situations. They're trying to take the mir miracle working power out of God's hands and convince you that your God is not powerful. The God of e Israel is powerful. The God of Israel is your God. There is nothing he cannot do. If he wants to open the Red Sea, he'll open the Red Sea. If he wants the walls of Jericho to fall down, the walls of Jericho will fall down. And it's been excavated and the people who have excavated it have said that it's strange. It seems like the walls all fell out. There's no explanation other than God. So once, once this, this happened, just as God said, well, they, they marched around, the trumpets blew, the people shouted, the walls fell down. And once the walls were down, the Israelites charged the city and they completely destroyed everyone and everything in the city except for Rahab and her family. They made good on, on that covenant. At Joshua 6.26 it says, And Joshua adjured them at that time, saying, Cursed be the man before the Lord that rises up and buildeth the city of Jericho. He shall lay the foundation thereof in his firstborn, and in his second youngest son shall he set up the gates of it. And so the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame was noise throughout the country. So, so that, what Joshua said, that curse he spoke, came to pass if your homework doers in your announcement, 1 Kings 16.34, you'll see where that happened about four centuries later. Uh, chapter 7, uh, when you get into chapter 7, we remember from chapter 6 that God gave Israel clear instructions, take no plunder from Jericho. Uh, none of it's for you. Kill all the stuff, leave, I'm sorry, kill all the people, leave all their stuff behind except for the gold and the silver and the bronze. Take that and bring it to the tabernacle. That's, that's for, to be used in the worship of, of Jehovah. But as you read, a man named Achan, uh, one of the Israelites, he, he'd taken some plunder from Jericho, unbeknownst to anyone else, and he hid it under his tent. Without knowing that that had happened, the next city they were going to take is, is uh, spelled A-I, and I'll, I'll say A-E, maybe, how it's pronounced. They were pretty confident in the power of God, and, and A-E was, was a small city, so Joshua sent 3,000 men to take the city. He didn't send the whole army. And, and it turned out that they were quickly overpowered by the, by the fighting men of the city. And they were defeated. 36 of, Israel, of the Israeli soldiers were killed. And the, the name Achan in Hebrew means trouble. And it's interesting that God arranged for names of these folks to reveal their destiny. Achan brought trouble on the whole, whole nation of Israel being disobedient to God by taking this Babylonian garment and some money. So there's an important principle there that we can never sin as believers without affecting other believers, other members of the church. If, if one Christian, if one member of this church gets cold, it lowers the temperature of the whole room. You see, your faith matters. Your walk matters. Your participation matters. I've told you that over and over and over again that you... Your presence here encourages everyone else who's here. If, if you sin and you start turning away from God and you, you start being at church less often, it, the whole temperature of what's going on here cools. Same thing. Achan's sin brought trouble on the children of Israel, and it resulted in 36 deaths of soldiers. And ultimately, he and his entire family were stoned to death because of this sin. So no sooner did Israel get into the promised land finally after this long journey they experienced a victory with God at Jericho and, and then uh, experienced some calamity A.E. Uh, shepherded in by, by sin, of one, a sin of one person, disobedience now as, as I open with this morning as, as we read of Joshua's reaction to the defeat, we, we should remember some of the reaction that Moses and, and the generation before them had, 
had when difficulty came to them, that first generation. Uh, remember, when they were first freed from Egypt, they kept saying over and over, we should have stayed in Egypt. Or, remember that? Or, oh, those, those onions and the leeks, man, they were so good. We, we could eat our filled onions. And I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound particularly attractive to me. Can you, can you, can you imagine a, a group meeting of them and their breath? <laughs> you people and your onions, huh? But, but the people don't change much. And, and here, they had this tremendous success at Jericho with God, and, and they get a relatively small thumping at Ai, and, and they start grumbling. At Joshua 7, 6, it says, And Joshua ran, or tore his clothes, and he fell to earth upon his faith before the ark of the Lord until the evening. So he stayed there all afternoon. He and the elders of Israel put dust on their heads, and the, the act of, of placing dust on one's head at that time was a, an act to show great remorse or, or great repentance. And at 7 7 it says, and Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, why have, you, why have thou all brought this people over to Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? Did you bring us across the river that you could have us destroyed? Would to God that we had been content and dwelled on the other side of Jordan. Oh, Lord, what shall I say when Israel turns their backs before their enemies and run? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it and shall environ us around or, or surround us and cut off our name from the earth. And what wilt thou do unto thy great name? And the Lord said to Joshua, Get thee up. Wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? I, I like that. Joshua's laying on his face before the Ark of the Covenant bellyache, and God says, stand up. Again, people don't change much. Sometimes God finds me bellyaching. Sometimes God finds me saying, I don't know what we're going to do as a church. I don't know what I'm going to do in my life. I don't know what to do with this or that. And God says, stand up. Where's your faith? Where's your trust? Haven't you seen the other things I've already done? How could you people see miracle after miracle after miracle over some 40 years and at the first little defeat you want to tuck your tail and you want to run the other way? How is that possible? And I say the same thing to you. You've seen miracle after miracle after miracle in your life. You've seen God work miraculous things in your life, and the first little difficulty, our tendency is to tuck our tail and say, oh, woe is me. This Christian life is so hard, maybe I should have stayed a pagan. It'd been much easier to live out my 70, 80, 90 years, however long God allows me living in sin, and just go to hell. As if, oh, that's not going to be hard. You know, look, you look at this situation, and maybe it seemed like the punishment that Achan and his family received was awfully severe, but God was looking out for a nation. If God was to allow disobedience to go unanswered and the whole nation become disobedient, the spiritual death of the nation would have been more disastrous. It would have been more harsh, more tragic than the deaths of a few guilty individuals. When you get to chapter 8, Joshua does what was commanded of God, what Moses told Joshua to do back in Deuteronomy chapter 27, back where, where it was said, when you get in the land, go to the center of the land and divide the people of Israel up into two groups on, on mountains, leaders of the tribes, some on one mountain on one side, some on the other, and some will shout blessings, what will happen if you are obedient, and others on the other mountain, you remember that, will shout down curses, the curses that will occur if you choose disobedience. So it's amazing. Here's one in places you, you, you see a glimpse of God being able to see what's going to happen ahead of time. That when he told Israel, when you enter the land, this is what you're to do, he knew that they were going to have just experienced a victory at Jericho and a defeat a, a victory in obedience and 
defeat of disobedience. And with, with that as the background of these people, that in their recent memory, they stand between these two mountaintops, just as Moses had said, and they had people, leaders of tribes on one mountain, saying, if you're obedient, such and such will happen. These blessings will happen. And the ones on the other side would answer and say, if you're disobedient, these curses will happen. And after each, the people said, amen, we know it. We agree. This is what will happen. And at Joshua 8.35, it says, And there was not a word of all that Moses commanded, which Joshua read not before the congregation of Israel, with the women and the little ones and the strangers that were conversant among them. So they, they have had this. Jim, I'm done here already. They've had this. A, a victory, a defeat, they stand between these two mountaintops and it's, it's, it's related to them with that as the background. You know, you know that if you're obedient, God will bless you in these ways. You know if you're disobedient, these bad things will happen. And I, and I, you know, if you can find the context, it, it was so real to them. It made such, such sense to them. And again, the same is true for your life. You know, if you find obedience in your life, that God will bless you. You know, if you turn back to disobedience from which you've come, we've all come from disobedience, that we will know the cursings, we will know God removing his hand, and we will have what the world has for us. Let's move closer in. As we close, uh, we'll have a... a trailer out front and if you're able and willing to stick around and help tote boxes out it'll be greatly appreciated uh, let's, let's, let's pray today as we close dear heavenly father and we, we give this day to you we give our lives to you we thank you for Jesus Christ And we love, as we're just saying, we love, we so love to tell the story. That we glory not in ourselves, but in, in our Savior. And we love to share the good news of the gospel. So, Father, bless this church. Give us your Holy Spirit. Make of us ministers of the word. Put us into the, into the lives, inject us into the lives of people who, who you know will answer yes to you. Give us a boldness. Give us the audacity to share the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.